Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to you. I said good afternoon because I thought I'd err on the side of those who might be joining us from the other part of the world. But good morning to those of you who are in continental Europe. A very warm welcome to you. My name is Damendra Kanani. I am the moderator for this conversation that we have, this round table, uh, with a, a small but perfectly formed group of individuals who come from a, set, a range of sectors uh, across the world, but also academia, uh, politics, uh, the private sector, etc. and so forth, to talk about the trade and diplomacy nexus. Um, here today, what we want to think about is markets, connectivity and technology. Um, our setting and our scene, I suppose our backdrop is what is happening in Ukraine and how the world uh, only woke up about 10 or 12 days ago to a heinous act of an invasion and has unsettled um, all of us. Um, across the world, both in terms of markets, technology, supply chains, and most importantly, um, uh, basically starving uh, a lot of the world uh, of fuel and make, making and hiking fuel prices through the roof, um, which is in, obviously having huge impact on fuel prices and the potential for a massive a poverty trap emerging uh, on our shores and across the world. Today, we want to talk to you about the Trade and Diplomacy Network Nexus. When this series was first hatched, we wanted to think about how do we make sure that the kinds of um, diplomatic and trade efforts that are undertaken can be done in, in a manner that actually are, actually are recognising and acknowledging the liberal, uh, let's say, or let's say value-based world order. And how do we make sure that the role that Europe plays um, is one which not only does it trans, um, let's say, export uh, goods and services, but also its model in terms of its values um, and how it shapes behaviour through its trade and diplomatic connections and uh, ways of working. So we, this, this roundtable is 90 minutes long. We have a range of you here to discuss how we make sure that the trade and diplomacy uh, nexus can work for good, can progress values in a, in a meaningful way. And how do we overcome some of the barriers that we've experienced in the past? But also when we think ahead, when we think ahead uh, in the context of our experiences around COVID and what that did to supply chains and the notion of the, the rising notion of sovereignty and suddenly wanting globalization to be put back in the box, which is impossible. Uh, but and now with the Ukrainian crisis, and the invasion of Ukraine and what that means for our new world order. What does that mean for trade and diplomatic relations? And how do we make sure that connectivity, uh, markets uh, and technology are enhanced for the good? So that's what we want to talk to you about. We have a range of you in this roundtable. I'd like to say that just to remind you that this is a, a debate that we've done in, um, undertaken in partnership with HCL Technologies. We're very pleased that they partners, partnered with this, a very large Indian company that's based um, um, uh, both out of India but across Europe and across the world. So uh, pleased that they are partnering with us on this debate. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, invite each and one, every one of you to engage in this conversation. Firstly, the rules of the game. Please make sure your screen is on, um, that you are muted, uh, and you have your nameplate, uh, or your name, um, I, I gave away my age there, I, called, I said nameplate there. Make sure your name is digitally pronounced on, on the screen, um, and so that you know, I can, I can tell who wants to come in. And raise your virtual hand, and if you don't know where that is, go to the participants icon, press that and I'll be able to know which one of you would like to come in in terms of response. Final word, this is not a kind of a Q&A between those who speak. This is a, back, this is a round table to conversation to really look at the dilemma of the trade and diplomacy nexus and see what we can do to improve it, um, enhance it and what kind of solutions and recommendations can we think of as we move ahead and especially think about what might come after uh, the invasion of Ukraine. So thank you, colleagues. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'd like to kick off by inviting Romana. Romana, are you there? I'm here. Do you hear me? I do. Welcome, Romana. Please, would you introduce yourself? And that's for everyone that I call on um, uh, to make sure that, you know, everyone knows who you are. Could you, uh, I suppose, react to my introductory remarks, but also put your take, give us your take, given where you're coming from on the trade and diplomacy Nexus. Over to you, Romana. Sure. Thanks a lot uh, for, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I am an EIS um, 
diplomat uh, and special envoy for, for connectivity ambassador at large uh, in the EIS. Uh, this is a massive theme. And um, I went carefully through the list of questions which you <clears throat> have, have put forward. And I think each and, and every one of them would merit a separate discussion sure. on their own. And um, I would uh, love to engage in general discussions on what does it mean, uh, uh, really, the link between connectivity and sovereignty, uh, the fact that connectivity is a value-based system and, and how it reflects on different uh, relationships within, within societies and between countries, etc. But I have decided <clears throat> to focus in these uh, few uh, introductory words on digital, on digital connectivity, because I think what we are seeing with the invasion on Ukraine uh, um, has, has again sort of brought up the importance uh, and vitality of, uh, of robust and, and sustainable digital connectivity. Uh, it has proven absolutely critical uh, it started, of course, I mean, at least uh, our, our big realization how existentially important this is started with the pandemic. Uh, and now um, in, in Ukraine, under the worst of circumstances, we do see how digital connectivity um, caters for basically uh, a, a number of existential issues that are linked to the to the fight there, uh, I think what I want to uh, sort of put on the table is the need to to take really a deep dive in how do we invest more in and better in three things linked to to digital connectivity. Okay. The first one is infrastructure, being both physical or human infrastructure in terms of knowledge and skills. This is, I think, in particular important for medium and small size countries, developing economies. I think the, the digital transition is giving them a historical opportunity to jump a generation of development to really become far more resilient and far more competitive. Uh, and this is an opportunity that we should not, we should not miss. Uh, the second uh, investment is investment in trust. If we really want to um, ensure the growth of, of economy based on data, we have to find a common agreement on common rules and the interoperability. We have, you know, there is a Japanese notion of data free flow with trust. Trust is I think the most important commodity uh, when it comes to, to digital connectivity mm -hmm. and we need far more uh, agreement on how to, to provide for, for this. And the third one is investment in security. Um, I, I think everyone now <laughs> fully understands that with uh, digital, because it's systemic and creates dependencies that can be weaponized, we have to um, invest utmost in the resilience of these systems. We see it with uh, on the production side, we, de we see it on the, on the cybersecurity side. I mean, uh, we, we see it with, I was uh, following yesterday, an incredible exchange between Elon Musk and, and, and Kadaev. So, uh, we have to understand really uh, the the security side of things and how uh, incredibly dependent we are on the system that has been built uh, in in between. And for all of this, of course, uh, you need a lot of uh, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. A lot of work is ahead of us. Uh, I think the last uh, the last uh, two and a half years were a roller coaster. And uh, we need to put our brains together uh, and figure out how to answer um, basically all of the questions that you have put before us. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to the Great. exchange to give you 
few elements so that we can start. No, Roman, that was really helpful and really effective and insightful. And you create kind of a infrastructure for conversation, if I can call it. I like your three points. Um, and I suppose in terms of, I think you're right. We always think about infrastructure. We always think about the physical rather than the human. Um, I, uh, and I particularly appreciate your codifying regulations and other matters under trust. Um, and that, that, that idea that we now have a different frontier oh, in terms of continent connectivity, which is about security. And the only question I have, and this is for all of us actually, is that does our current multilateral structures, do our multi current you know, multilateral structures work? Can they work in the context of connectivity? And that's a big question for us. Who, you know, who looks after, who's a caretaker of you know, the rules-based game and in terms of connectivity and digital, the, the issues that you've talked about? Should it be NATO? Should it be the World Trade Organization? Who, you know, who is, is it UN? Um, and you know, do we need to hatch something different and new? But those are very big questions in this, but in this debate. But obviously, and how the diplomatic effort is coordinated is key to this. I want to move to Hong uh, Louis Hui Lim. Yeah, I hope I pronounced your name right. Hello, a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning. To, Good morning, to Ambassador. You. Please oh, do introduce yourself. Morning. Hi, my name is Hong Kwai. I'm the Ambassador of Singapore to, um, to the EU. And I'm very happy to join all of you here this morning at this uh, roundtable. Uh, thank you for taking this uh, very timely uh, initiative to on this very important topic on connectivity, on the nexus between connectivity, diplomacy, and the digital arena. I think uh, this is an issue that all of us are grappling with. And uh, I would just like to follow up, uh, being very mindful of the time that we have and the number of participants in this roundtable, just follow up very quickly uh, with two points to what Ambassador Romana has said. And I uh, fully associate myself with what she has said. I think it's important to build uh, on those areas that she had mentioned, in particular on trust. Um, and security for our digital system. So just let me start by saying very quickly that um, you know it's very clear that we are well into the digital um, age and the pandemic has only accelerated the adoption of digital technologies. But the digital, digital revolution goes much further than just simply the way we communicate with each other. You know, AI has helped Moderna develop the uh, COVID-19 vaccine in record time. Uh, digital tools help all of us manage the uh, pandemic effectively. And technology is transforming cross-border trade and payments in record time. So indeed, the economic potential of the uh, digital economy is huge. And therefore, we must ask ourselves if we are correctly, all of us, if we are correctly positioned uh, to take advantage of these opportunities as well as to rise to the challenges that they pose. The digital revolution, I believe, is going to be as profound, as impactful on the distribution of global prosperity and politics as much as the industrial revolution. You know, when we look at the impact of AI on quantum computing, nanotechnology, for instance, they are going to transform economies and the social fabric of our society on an unprecedented scale. And therefore, my first point is this, that we must transform our economies, ourselves, and ready our workers um, for the digital age. You know, countries have done generally well in creating uh, analog frameworks and regulation. For instance, you know, on land, competition laws, movement of talent, but we need to do more to invest in the digital frameworks of the future, uh, such as digital identities, digital payment solutions, data exchanges, data authorization and content, for instance. These are some of the foundational elements and investments in this mm -hmm. digital infrastructure will accelerate our industry and digital transformation efforts. Meanwhile, for our workers, the digital transformation will be very disruptive, especially for those less skilled and on the wrong side of the digital divide. Therefore, it is quite crucial, we believe, to uh, invest in our workers to provide them with lifelong and continuing education so that they have the skills to compete uh, and earn a good living. We need to work uh, collaboratively with all stakeholders which means um, on all sides of the governments, employers, employees, and our partners to be inclusive and leave no one behind. And therefore, the second point that, I'm, that I would like to make today is mm -hmm. that uh, there is a in great incentive for us to deepen our global economic integration in the digital domain. Uh, existing uh, free trade agreements uh, and uh, plurilateral agreements such as the uh, CPTPP or the RCEP 
have already set up some rules to facilitate e-commerce. Uh, for instance, at the WTO, Singapore together with uh, partners such as Australia and Japan are co-conveners of the Joint Statement Initiative on e-commerce uh, to establish global rules to govern digital trade. But mm -hmm. focused digital economy agreements uh, can carry this goal much further. Uh, such digital economy agreements or DEAs, uh, in short, um, Singapore, we have already started with uh, partners such as Australia, New Zealand, Chile and the UK. And this will help provide reference points on common framework and rules for global digital trade, mm -hmm. including emerging technologies and data innovation. And it can also help to serve as uh, building blocks towards regional or global architecture. Yeah. Bilaterally, between the EU and Singapore, we have also agreed to accelerate steps towards a similar digital partnership. And uh, you know what we hope is that this will provide an overarching framework to strengthen digital connectivity, interoperability of digital markets, and policy frameworks uh, to facilitate digital trade. So to conclude, um, let me just say that digital technologies have empowered millions of people, but the divide between the haves and the have-nots in the digital world has also widened. And therefore, this is why we need a very coherent and concerted global response to manage this digital transition. Global digital standards, cooperation initiatives are very important. And most critically of all, they have to be inclusive, sustainable, and people focused, improving at improve, uh, in, in focus at improving people's daily lives. So let me just stop there and I look forward to a fruitful exchange. Later Hong Wai, thank, thank you so you. much. No, thank you very much. And, you know, in some parts, you I suppose you kind of answer my question about multilateralism, because when you refer to what you're initiating in terms of e-commerce and agreements, these are agreements about the you know, potential future of uh, you know, digital trade, but they're elective, I imagine. Who's the rule maker in this and who's the rule keeper in this when, when things go wrong? And actually, what about the role of non-state actors? At the moment, we've seen Elon Musk provide you know, access to you know the, the internet in Ukraine and others, uh, and here's he come he comes in overnight and changes things to a certain extent. There's a kind of a new phenomenon here about the uh, the, the non-state actor, and we've seen how Silicon Valley has you know you know jettisoned so much of our rules and our values, and the governments are playing catch up. How do we make sure we you know are forewarned and use our foresight effectively? This is something for all of us to think about. But secondly, in terms of education, everyone talks about the need for education to catch up. But, you know, where in the world are we really doing digital education? Where are we making sure education is fit for the 21st century and making sure that the skill set that young people are uh, uh, you know, bringing into the world, the world of work, is what we need uh, in now, but also mostly into the future? Um, so some kind of quite big questions again. I know there's RB, this, this conversation is about trying to find those big questions. Uh, we're not going to be able to answer all of them. But on that, you know, I, I want to encourage all of you that if you have resources or responses to what you've heard and ambassadors that have got, you know, ideas or things that they're doing, for example, from Singapore, if you've been any resources regarding the e-commerce uh, trade agreements, please do put them on the chat. We will make sure we circulate all of the information and the kind of comments and questions to all of you afterwards. I want to move to um, um, uh, 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 someone closer to the, uh, unfortunately, the uh, the terrible action in Ukraine, and that's Talej. Talej, very warm welcome to you. Hello. Hello, hello, good morning. Good morning. Please do introduce yourself and give us, you know, your take on the situation, and especially when, we, given your geographical positioning as well, which I think has a, I mean, I don't know, it's for you to say in terms of what that means in terms of this conversation. Over to you, please do introduce yourself. Hello, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, very extremely important uh, roundtable discussion. And uh, my name is Tadej Rupel, I'm national coordinator uh, with Slovenian government for uh, digitalization, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. And um, as you rightly said, today we are living in a tuna world, as my Oxford colleagues uh, would say, so turbulent, uncertain, novel and ambiguous world. As uh, uh, the external environment uh, changes rapidly and uh, unpredictably, so making decisions 
uh, and decision makers look sometimes weak. So what worked yesterday won't necessarily work tomorrow. So recent event, as you rightly said, the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine proves exactly that. So uh, I think that um, the current situation in U Ukraine is really um, terrible in terms of the humanitarian crisis, which we are witnessing. And due to the vicinity, although we are not uh, sharing immediate borders, but it's our eastern neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and for European Union, we do share uh, common, uh, 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 common ground and common aspirations in terms of uh, bringing uh, uh, the values and sharing the same uh, set of values with the uh, Ukrainians. Let me just briefly say uh, about the dig digital cooperation. As, as we know that uh, digital cooperation must keep pace with the accelerating shift uh, towards a digital world. Uh, otherwise, we, we of course uh, risk uh, a growing digital divide. So European countries, uh, and we also uh, are focusing today on the Indo-Pacific uh, countries, suffer from uh, the weakness that many of the most powerful tech companies uh, are, uh, you know, playing the ground uh, in, in these areas in our global scene. So, but in, in that regard, I think that fragmentation of such industries can also bring some uh, advantages and, of course, namely distributing of wealth, uh, dispersed employment and as well uh, different flexible policy approaches to support the economic development uh, of the most dynamic places, while at the same time uh, countering the uh, potentially negative spiral of ge geographically restricted development. So, to reach uh, you know, the new global digital equity, we have to make sure that uh, um, we close the gap which uh, digital divide is, is causing and enable equal access and opportunities to the digital connectivity tools, resources and services. However, uh, the, the global multi business companies might be in the position to set global standards and including uh, talking about gathering, uh, monitoring and the use of data, mm -hmm. thereby also giving the uh, governments an, a, a strategic advantage. So as um, digital technologies uh, profoundly reshape societies, mm. marginal countries risk being left behind in the fourth industrial revolution. This leaves the EU and its member states with partners with a role and responsibility to show that uh, there are alternatives beyond what uh, China and US propose on, on that as a, a hub for the big tech companies, as you rightly mentioned at the beginning. So in general, I think that digital diplomacy can contribute to secure liberal norms like openness, transparency, rather than allowing an all too strong state or dependence on giant tech companies. Mm. At the same time, uh, the Indo-Pacific um, uh, is, is uh, a home also to three out of four largest economies outside the EU. And by 2030, I think 90% of 2.4 billion new middle income class members will come from the Indo-Pacific. So the trade and digital diplomacy nexus for the European Union in the Indo-Pacific is therefore very much clear. And Europe has to reach out to new partners to provide them with real strategic options rather than having to choose between existing uh, models currently. Uh, it was rightly mentioned by Ambassador Blahut in, in terms of the new global gateway. This initiative could be an important instrument to this objective, and this is because digital connectivity involves uh, three interconnected pillars, infrastructure, regulation and business, and leaving infrastructure aside, partnership based on a global gateway initiative can benefit from uh, an inclusive human-centered uh, EU regular, regulatory approach to digitalization. Let me just mention that there are some concrete vehicles in this global gateway, which mm -hmm. will allow also the public-private partnership, PPPs, which will mobilize uh, um, through the Team Europe initiative and uh, there is a strong multi-stakeholder approach to digital diplomacy through the partnership platforms and uh, digital for development. The D4D hubs are one of those which we are trying also to establish with Indo-Pacific on a good practices on D4D for Africa and D4D for Latin America. 
But uh, all this aside, I think that um, uh, the current situation, is, as you mentioned in Ukraine, uh, we, we need to, to bring all those actors uh, which are responsible to secure peace and to start negotiations are very critical and necessary. And we hope that uh, the aggression which is currently in place by Russian Federation will stop immediately. So to, to stop this humanitarian crisis, refugee crisis, uh, and uh, I believe that um, digital in current uh, current situation or cybersecurity uh, to provide assistance uh, to Ukraine in this particular moment is of second importance. Uh, we are now dealing with with a more serious um, humanitarian uh, uh, atrocities, which which needs to be stopped immediately. So thank you so much. Thank you. That's thank you. really uh, really helpful, especially your reference to the global gateway, and you know the the, the what you see as a, an emerging positive platform through the global gateway. Uh, but you know, let's see. Time will tell. I'm not being a cynic about it, but I think how you know how do some of these initiatives take account of, or rather, have foresight enough to absorb shock in the system. And hey, if there's anything that we've learned over the past uh, 36 months is there's total uncertainty, unpredictability in terms of what's going to come and hit us left field, whether that's a health crisis, an economic crisis. Now we have a security crisis and an invasion which is unsettling all our norms of, you know, what we see as being universal in terms of human rights. Um, um, I've seen a couple of people I'm going to be, refer to that just warn you that I'm going to bring you in at some point. That's one of our uh, delightful European young leaders, Jakob. I can see you sitting there comfortably. I'm not going to pull you in now. I'm just putting you on warning. And also, uh, one of our member, another one of our members, uh, the the delightful Monica Sanders, who I can see. I hope I hope it's her, because uh, uh, my eyesight's poor. But I'm just warning you. I'm going to ask you to come in because I, you know, I know that you will always have a different or perhaps a um, a, a slightly uh, um, angular sense of this this kind of conversation given when you're coming from. But before that, let me bring in Sin Young Park. Hello, Sin Young. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Sir. Hi, hello. Hello, hello a, warm well, a warm welcome to you. Good, good to welcome you again to one of our debates. Ah, thank you. Singyang, well, um, Singyang, please do introduce yourself. Obviously, I know you, but please do introduce yourself for the benefit of our virtual round table. And give us your take uh, on what you've heard so far. Thank you. So my name is Sinyoung Park. I work as uh, the Director of Regional Cooperation Integration in ADB's Economic Research Department. Well, um, uh, I, I, I agree with the form, uh, you know, the former speakers. In fact, uh, you know, this is uh, really a <laughs> huge agenda, and uh, uh, I think uh, everyone uh, is also really mindful about like how the digital connectivity uh, is uh, very important uh, for everyone to be able to unlock the uh, potential opportunities, uh, especially uh, in the uh, very uh, high time of uncertainty. Um, now, well, um, in Asia, well, the uh, I, I would actually define this uh, digital kind of uh, connectivity as uh, three forms. Uh, first is uh, you know the uh, availability, uh, and that uh, there has to be um, the uh, secure uh, the, and the reliable broadband, uh, the uh, infrastructure and then connectivity available uh, to allow people to be able to, uh, you know, also uh, take advantage of this uh, uh, digital transformation and opportunities uh, um, afforded uh, by the digital technology. And at the same time, uh, there has to be accessibility. Uh, this uh, will be uh, about uh, people, uh, ability. Uh, there has to be awareness, uh, digital awareness, and then the skills that allow people to also, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, these opportunities. And then thirdly, is the uh, public trust. The, uh, even when there's uh, enough uh, the uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, the, uh, also uh, to some extent that there's uh, um, the uh, you know the access is uh, 
uh, uh, possible. Uh, if the market is not uh, uh, somehow uh, very encouraging for people, uh, and then uh, also the uh, you know suppliers of these mm -hmm. services uh, to come, uh, that's going to uh, present the barrier. Actually, the rules and the regulations uh, will be very important to uh, protect the consumers, and then uh, also at the same time providing the uh, the uh, level playing fields for all the producers of the and then the service providers and uh, the across the uh, also borders you know there has to be a, a mutual sort of recognition and then uh, um, uh, and uh, some um, harmonization and standards that allow uh, the cross border, like you know, the uh, even trade of uh, some uh, uh, the, uh, the services uh, through digital technology. Uh, what's uh, quite uh, encouraging uh, from um, uh, what we see here is that uh, Asia has actually um, seen a rapid growth in uh, in all three of these mm. uh, dimensions of mm -hmm. the digital sort of you know the uh, connectivity. Um, the uh, internet uh, penetration uh, in the region, like if we sort of like look at even uh, just the five years ago, I mean, there was uh, less than like an, uh, like a 40% mm -hmm. uh, in uh, across Asia. Now uh, it is uh, over like a 60% on average uh, across Asia, but Asia is wide. Uh, of course, yeah. so there's a wide variation. Uh, in uh, ASEAN, uh, you know, it's, it's actually even close to like a 80% Indeed. of, uh, uh, you know, people who uh, have access to internet. So there has there has been a really uh, uh, remarkable increase in an internet uh, access, and uh, we also see uh, you know the uh, the the uh, pandemic impact. Uh, the pandemic uh, kind of prompted the uh, the digital transformation uh, by need <laughs> mm. and uh, the digital uh, you know the technology have been availed uh, by the uh, even public sector more actively uh, to allow providing the uh, you know the uh, delivery of uh, public services or even uh, allowing the uh, um, the you know transfer of uh, uh, income uh, during the uh, pandemic to the uh, very low income and then the poor households. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, uh, the use of the digital services have uh, become uh, you know much more uh, prevalent uh, across uh, um, you know many parts of Asia. Okay. Uh, what we also see is the you know the uh, cross border like you know the services trade uh, using digital services. In fact, um, the digital technology had a great uh, potential of uh, you know the increasing the tradeability of services. Uh, before the services were uh, sure. mainly considered non-tradable, now yeah. the services are becoming much more tradable, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that there we actually need uh, a lot more of this, uh, you know, the uh, international harmonization of the rules and the standards and agreements on the uh, services trade, uh, as uh, earlier our, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the Singapore, um, the uh, Mr. Uh, Hong Hui mm -hmm. Hong Lim uh, suggested that uh, you know the a lot of potential benefits of having international uh, cooperation and some uh, trade agreements that promote these uh, cross border services sure Xin Yang, i suppose the question again this is for all of us who are the rule makers and who are the rule keepers and when you've got you know uh, as you say the pen levels of penetration that we have now but also the growth of telecommunications and digital companies i'm not sure if we've got any telco companies uh, uh joining us here today um i'd hope that someone would have been but you know their growth is vast and significant. And what we're learning in this crisis is that, you know, as long as the private sector has, you know, the same value set as you, let's say in government or a liberal sense, they're going to do the right thing. But if they haven't, they're not. And how do you, you know, who are the rule makers and keepers in a situation in Asia where the value, value bases or the value uh, principles are very, very different as they are in Europe and as they are where we're now witnessing between Russia and the rest of the world to a certain extent, to a great extent. And when you think about China and India, etc. and so forth. So there's something kind of here which is a knotty problem that we perhaps need to think about urgently rather than leave to too late. But thoughts on that are really warmly welcome. Um, I want to bring in, and thank you, Sinyan, that was really helpful. But, you know, as a development bank, an Asian development bank, you know, there's something there about 
how do you work in with partnership with government and other institutions internationally that the investments motivate and incentivize the types of behaviors uh, but also the conditionality you put in put in place for making sure people do the right thing but these are again big questions that to, to be thinking about i want to bring in didier didier are you there i can't quite see you right now but i believe you're i'm here hello 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 well, a warm welcome to you did you please introduce yourself to the benefit of our virtual round table and you know i know that you'll have a particular view on this on the set of questions on the issues that we've just been talking about yeah, over to you didier thank you so uh, i'm the deputy general director of the, the belgian foreign trade agency uh foreign trade it's really foreign trade it's not like i'm representing um foreign affairs of belgium because sometimes the the economic aspects they do have an an influence on political and vice versa but they are two different things um i heard already a lot of interesting comments and i i, I really must say that i uh, i can underwrite all of the positions which have been taken in so far so it's it's only going to add up to that what i'm going to say um when i heard romana starting off and saying that infrastructure trust and security are the three most important things when we're talking about economic collectivity and connectivity. I fully agree. Uh, we could also look at it um, in, in the other way. What the market needs is, uh, does not need, is uncertainty. And uncertainty can have uh, a, a couple of um, reasons. Firstly, political. That is what we are seeing now with Ukraine and Russia. It can also be sociological. Uh, there can be um, uh, a lack of development in, in certain country for, uh, countries for historical reasons. We have seen it with the pandemic, when countries start taking their own measures and restrictive measures and protection of their own markets. But it can also be natural uh, if we're thinking about climate change, if we're thinking about um, the lack of resources, uh, raw materials that we are experiencing. And which is also influencing the connectivity because if you have that mobile phone if you have those computers we saw it with the the, the chip problem um a couple of months ago in mm. uh, in china which delayed uh, a lot of uh, uh, deliveries but all of that i think we need to to understand that connectivity in my opinion and in the opinion of the, the belgian foreign trade agency it's, it's not a system as such, and it's not changing um, the rules. It's a tool in the very same system that we are experiencing since the first industrial revolution, where a letter took first three weeks time to be sent from Europe to, um, uh, to the US, for instance, uh, by boat. Now it's done in a split second. So there's, there's a development um, and we need to be very careful with that development. It's not another development than when we were looking at a black and white TV in the 1960s, and now we are looking at digital TVs. Uh, the, the right question, and I think you you have asked it already a number of times, where is the regulation and who is going to take up that regulation? And there again, we see that um, it, it is a kind of a balance which we need to find between government and multilateral uh, regulation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus the importance of multinationals. Also, that is not new. Uh, we have seen it in the past that big companies, uh, we can refer to uh, to the banking world two decades ago, who seemed like more important than most um, uh, multilateral organizations or most uh, um, political players. But in 2008, there was some kind of correction. And I think it, it is a difficult exercise, but we will have to provide with regulations that make it possible to have sustainable development within the connectivity progress and, and, and the fourth industrial revolution, but also some self-regulation from the multinationals that come together and make it workable. Um, I think we, within the European Union, we had those discussions with Meta uh, and, and we had that legislation about GDPR, which already provided for some kind of framework. We need to continue that, to, be, to, to continue to be in dialogue that regulations are not um, reframing the development within the connectivity sector. Mm. Um, 
but it has to be open enough uh, and, and well enough so that there is a framework which is light enough at one hand, but on the other hand is also strong enough um, to provide security because uh, and, and certainty, because that is what the market needs, certainty. Sure, did you thank you? And, um, and you know, thank you for bringing both that kind of very member state perspective, but also putting it, putting it large. But again, you know, I encourage all of us um, that, you know, deconstruction is so much more um, easy to hand construction is harder and it's about who you know what should what should therefore happen because we keep on hearing about some of the problems that we need to address but we're short on what the solutions might be and that's not to be kind of critical of all of us but we always find it harder don't we in debates and in some policy thinking to actually think about solutions more effectively and you know what occurs to me from what all of you have said is that what's the achilles heel in this conversation? What is the Achilles heel that actually that we need to be thinking and addressing uh, head on um, as we move forward? But that again, uh, you know, for everyone to think about. I want to bring in um, uh, Ambassador from uh, the Philippines, Eduardo. Hello, Eduardo de Vega. Hello. Yes, uh, uh, good morning. Good uh, morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful also for the presence of my fellow ASEAN uh, uh, envoys, because I'm speaking not only from the Philippine perspective, but from the ASEAN perspective. I, of course, uh, associate myself with uh, the comments made by uh, my colleagues here, uh, including uh, our friends from the EU and the ADB. Uh, I'll go to what you were asking, who are the rule makers? Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the way to uh, push a, a digital diplomacy, uh, or the, the actors who will play this, play this part, are the same actors who who push it, uh, uh, and all have a role, the public sector, the private sector. It should be pushed nationally, regionally, and globally. And it's the same way that the uh, customary rules of international law are formed through state practice. Uh, and uh, various organizations, including the WTO, have a role. For example, from the national perspective, the uh, Philippines, along with other countries, attach great importance to electronic commerce, uh, due to its critical role in this global post-pandemic recovery. Um, and it has accept, accelerated the growth of the digital economy in our countries. Uh, in the Philippines case, 24% uh, uh, growth in digital economy, and we have our e-commerce Philippines roadmap. In the multilateral sphere, let me refer to the WTO, which you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a WTO work program on electronic commerce. And there was a WTO ministerial conference in 2017 in Buenos Aires where uh, there was a joint statement on electronic commerce. So that declaration has 86 members covering 90% of world trade. Regionally, there is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC and uh, the member economies are striving to implement uh, the APEC internet and digital economy, economy roadmap. Now, as for cooperation, well, this is where um, uh, I would like to raise ASEAN. Uh, mm. The Philippines is the current country coordinator for the ASEAN-EU uh, dialogue. Uh, and within ASEAN, we have our own master plan on ASEAN connectivity, uh, MPAC 2025, uh, which uh, focuses on the five following strategic areas. Number one, sustainable infrastructure. Number two, digital innovation. Number three, seamless logistics number four, regulatory excellence, and number five, people mobility. These have been mentioned by some of our speakers, especially the need for infrastructure and logistics. And the vision of our master plan is to achieve a seamless and comprehensively connected ASEAN that will promote competitiveness, inclusiveness, and a greater sense of community. 80% uh, are, are in fact connected, as our friend uh, Ms. Park mentioned. Now, the Philippines priority areas uh, for the ASEAN EU dialogue include digital technology and cybersecurity. And this is consistent, and this is parallel with what the EU in their joint communication in the um, European strategy for cooperation in the Pacific um, last September um, uh, was mentioning among the priority areas they mentioned are digital governance and partnerships, as well as connectivity. These do not work in a vacuum. For example, if I mention the EU priority areas, there's also sustainable and inclusive prosperity, green trans transition, security and defense, ocean governance in the ASEAN <laughs> case, among the priorities of maritime cooperation, 
biodiversity conversation and management, climate action, uh, sustainable goals, and so forth. This year, uh, the European Union hosts to, uh, plans to host a commemorative summit in honor of the 45th anniversary. And among the possible de deliverables uh, should be um, advancing the EU ASEAN ministerial statement and connectivity in light of the global gateway, which mm -hmm. was mentioned earlier. Uh, so to conclude, I would definitely, I would conclude that um, the aspirations for the EU for global digital connectivity align with the interests of the smaller and medium-sized economies in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, it's MSS, MSMEs, which are actually, and, and women entrepreneurs, which are the um, uh, 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 backbone of the economy and uh, uh, our role as states and multilateral organizations to put the enabling environment. Private sectors uh, will lead this endeavor. Uh, there's public-private par par partnership, which works nationally and also uh, should work uh, in uh, international cooperation. And lastly, I cannot uh, escape, leave the elephant in the room, the current situation in Ukraine. Obviously, it's not a positive, but as diplomats, we are expected to do the impossible, and I remain optimistic. Uh, Diplomacy will prevail. Our, our our Slovenian colleague knows precisely that uh, they are playing a role now in these diplomatic overtures. Diplomacy has to prevail, and then we can go back to global cooperation, including global connectivity. Eduardo, thank you. Uh, but you know, some might let me be devil's advocate, and this is not for you to come back to, but it's for all of us to think about. Some might say the Ukraine uh, um, situation, the invasion uh, by Russia, is uh, you know symptomatic of the failure of diplomacy to do its job in the way that it should have done, and basically that people were perhaps either asleep at the wheel or actually thinking that actually, those who were soothsayers were so, actually thought this would never happen. Never happen. Our channels are open and we never uh, anticipate it. And we've had so many people say, Mia culpa, that actually, you know, I read it wrong. So, what is it about what we think about in terms of 21st century diplomatic efforts that needs to change without being critical of any of our colleagues here from the diplomatic network? It's just about we need to be able to kind of have those, these kind of exchanges so that we can improve and progress. Uh, and so, uh, uh, some thoughts on that will be helpful. And, and thank you for bringing the issue about women uh, and uh, women as economic, you know, backbone. We have we have paid very little attention to that issue in terms of the potential, but also the the different kind of norm setting that can take place with more more women in the room and in the economy playing an active part. I want to go to um, Torborn. Torborn, uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Torborn, Torbjorn. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I've seen your comment, as others have. Say a little bit about what you're, what you're trying to, you know, what you mean by that. Right. Thank you. So uh, I'm leading uh, the work of the UN Conference on Trade and Development in the area of e-commerce and the digital economy, and, and I'm very happy to be part of this discussion. Uh, we, we often tend to uh, focus strongly on connectivity to make sure that as many people as possible and many companies as possible can use uh, use it. But I think it's very important that we don't lose track of the production side of this. Uh, it's, we need to pay attention to how we can ensure that uh, more people, more enterprise and more countries are able to create and capture value in the digital uh, economy and society that we are seeing evolving. And if you look at the really global picture here for a second, you can see that it's a very unusual situation when it comes to the uh, the vision of where value is created around mm -hmm. the world. It's not the traditional North versus the South. No. It's very much um, the US and China that are dominating the scene. One very big developed country and one very big emerging economy. Uh, and just to give you a few numbers, 90% of the market capitalization of the world's largest digital platforms relate to the US and China. The share of the EU is about 3 or 4%. <laughs> Uh, when you look at the, the funding for artificial intelligence startups, more than 90% goes to the US and China. And when you look at the, uh, the, the rate at which 5G uh, connectivity is being rolled out, the fastest rates are in US and China. Mm. So this is ra just raising some, uh, some bells, I think, uh, especially when we talk about the interaction here between Europe and 
and Asia outside of China, but also with China, this is not the biggest flows right now. And I think what is very critical in this context is to look at data. Mm. Because data today is the most important economic and strategic resource in a digitalizing economy and society. And we need to be very careful here to, um, to, to discuss. We don't have all the answers, far from it, when it comes to dealing with data in the, at the global level. And we are seeing a very fragmented landscape because the approach is taken by the United States, by the Europe, uh, European Union, by China, by India, by Russia as well, uh, are very different. Uh, at the same time, the digital economy is very global in nature. So this is uh, uh, building a basis for not very uh, constructive collaboration across the world. And this is partly also why we're seeing such difficulties in coming to any global agreements on how to deal with data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think this is also partly why we're seeing some reluctance in many of the poorer countries to engage in the World Trade Organization on the e-commerce negotiations, because they don't feel that they are really ready to um, to deal with the very complex issues of data, which is very multidimensional in nature. But governance here will be crucial if we want to build greater partnerships across the world in any direction, including between uh, Europe and Asia, I think. So uh, let me just uh, pause there and I just conclude that if we don't manage to deal with this issue of data and, and perhaps also platform governance, we risk seeing uh, further digitalization not bring, becoming the big equalizer of our economies, but rather uh, adding to the inequalities and divides that we are seeing right now. So then thank you. And I think your, the figures that you quote are really sobering in terms of what the future holds and reinforcing the bipolarity of the world in terms of the means of production and the level of R&D in what, let's face it, will be the defining game of all our livelihoods in the future, which is both in terms of um, artificial intelligence and what that will do to our societies. And, you know, it's very sobering when you set out those figures in terms of where the investment's coming from and who is leading the way in terms of the two, we were talking about China um, 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 and the US. So uh, some sobering thoughts, and I'm sure uh, we've got some thinking to do, but I go back to what Romano was saying in the, in the, in the earlier part, where she really eloquently said, there's opportunities for the smaller governments and states to be able to jump, you know, uh, jump ahead um, a generation of development if we get the exchange of learning uh, 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 and, you know, say a trusted learning in place early on. Um, Sek, Sek Bonathi, uh, you have your hand up too. Yes. Hello, a warm welcome to you. Please Thank do you. introduce Good yourself. Morning. Thank you. I'm Sek Wanamaki, the Thai ambassador in Belgium and to the EU. And uh, first of all, let me just thank the Friends of Europe for organizing this uh, town hall event. Um, of course, I've listened carefully to the previous speakers and I've made uh, quite a number of notes. And of course, just to start off that, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ambassador Romana uh, had eloquently, as you said, uh, given us the um, overall the ingredients of our conversation today on the, um, the various aspects of the uh, digitalization in terms of infrastructure, the, the common rules and the security. But let me just um, join my uh, my uh, colleagues from Singapore, Philippines, and others. We, we come from what we call the, the, the ASEAN region, the 10 Southeast Asian countries. And ASEAN, this region, ASEAN region is the fastest growing internet market in the world. Uh, a new Google-led report released late last year stated that digital economy in ASEAN is on track to grow to 1 trillion US dollars by 2030. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, started 60 million new digital consumers have been added to this um, ASEAN region internet economy with 20 million joining in the first half of the year alone. So this clearly shows how the dynamism, the importance of the digitalization in the ASEAN economy is to the competitiveness of, of our region. And as the Philippine ambassador Ed has highlighted that here in the region, ASEAN region, we have the master plan on ASEAN connectivity 2025. And it is encouraging that the EU Indo-Pacific strategy outlook uh, does single out um, uh, support, EU support or EU um, uh, support for the ASEAN, for the implementation of the ASEAN digital master plan. 
And as my uh, Singapore colleague has pointed out, of course, the potential benefits um, of the of digitalization. Um, but of course, there are also the um, the downsides, which uh, he pointed out, and which I fully concur. Because as we go through the acceleration of the digital transformation, there will be job polarization and displacement of middle skilled. Uh, workers raising concerns about the income polarization, inequality, and adding and ina inadequate social protection. So it is important to um, uh, put more focus on investment in reskilling and upskilling the, um, uh, the, the the labor market. So in basically to nurture new talent um, to benefit from digitalization, and of course. Um, I'd just like to pick up the points made by um, uh, Tornborn, Torborn of Antad. And of course, I, I served in Geneva for four years and I worked closely with, with, with Antad and see the benefits, um, the contribution of Antad to the ongoing discussion on the um, rules, the norms of a multilateral uh, framework on uh, um, digital uh, framework or e-commerce. It is important that, firstly, we engage all stakeholders. Um, secondly, um, we need to understand developing countries will need to have a better understanding of the development dimension of the emerging multilateral rules on, on digital trade. And here, UNCTAD plays that important role in giving us the, the development dimension on, on, on this issue. Um, data, data is very important. Big data, we talk, now we're talking about big data. Now, it is important that um, we need to be, we need to, to promote big data literacy, not just digital literacy, but big data literacy, mm -hmm. not only for commercial or competitiveness advantages, but more importantly, in implementing the UN SDG 17 goals. Because with the implementation of the UN SDG 17 goals by 2030, that would be um, the step towards the eradication of, of poverty. And so it is important that when we talk about data, big data, mm -hmm. um, we need to be, um, we need to learn how to analyze, how to make use of big data as a tool for sustainable development. And in the context of the EU, of course, this year we mark the um, 45th anniversary of ASEAN EU um, dialogue, which we are strategic partners which means that by the end of this year, there'll be an ASEAN EU uh, summit. They call it a commemorative summit. Mm -hmm. And of course, there'll be an out outcome document with the 27 EU leaders and the 10 ASEAN leaders coming together in Brussels in December. And when it comes to the out outcome document, of course, we hope and we expect and we will work towards an outcome document that covers issues relating to the digital connectivity. And, and as Ambassador Ed has, 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 has pointed out the key aspects, but of course, when we talk about uh, strengthening digital uh, connectivity. We're talking about, again, investment in digital infrastructure, hardware and software. Secondly, on the governance of data, of regulating data tra uh, digital trade. Thirdly, on the um, digital economy and the financial technology of FinTech, capacity building in FinTech, particularly Luxembourg has the um, well, well, well advanced in the uh, FinTech banking system. Okay. And, and lastly, on the big data literacy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, you know, um, let's see what happens in the next five or six months. You know, you've got the summit. It'll be interesting to see how it learns from what we've done and what we've experienced in the past 10 years. Because let's face it, I mean, when we look at the 10 years ahead, um, uh, uh, they're going to be very different, very different to experience in Asian countries for the past, past decade. What kind of innovation and progressive thinking will take place, but also moving away from statements to actions, which I know is, you know, the usual thing to say, but actually in the world that we're living at the moment, we really need uh, much more um, action and active uh, and behavior that's going to uh, push us in the right progressive direction and learning from the past is going to be key. So thank you. Thank you for your contribution. We look forward to working with you also and the other Asian, Asian countries as we move towards December as well. Now, there's quite a number of you I'm going to bring in just to put you on notice that first I'm going to take Jakob. Jakob, you've been very patient, but Maria, I'll bring you in. Also, Ed and Monica in a few moments. So firstly, Jakob, over to you. Please do introduce yourself. 
Yes, hello, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Jacob Hessler. I'm German, living in Paris, and I actually co-founded an AI startup back in 2010 here in Paris. So, and I've contributed to quite a number of OECD initiatives on data, on big data governance, etc. But I would actually like to take a step back mm -hmm. with respect to trying to integrate the question of technology and actually what we're witnessing in Ukraine. And I think there is obviously a failure of the global order to produce order. We've seen that. And I think there is a big risk today that we see the world split in two. There is on the one hand, the sort of realists, they say it's about great power rivalry, zero sum game. And in fact, AI and digital has a great role to play in all this because it's an instrument of war, of disinformation, of propaganda in very, very classic ways. And on the other hand is sort of the liberal worldview, which is trade brings peace and we only have to connect more, trade more, and then that will, when we've obviously seen that probably that's not exactly true and that actually that piece has been quite frail and that in addition, these markets in an unregulated way become winner takes all markets. I mean, the way the five platforms, what Torbjorn said, the five platforms that account for 70% of advertising revenue, well, that shows that that the winner takes all characteristic of these digital markets actually can lead to enormous concentration, which in itself we've known for a long time poses a danger to the sort of harmonious development of, of, of capitalism or capitalistic societies. The question, Damindra, then what would be the solution? I think the solution is we need to is multi-layered and I think the UN at the very, very top level probably needs to scale back to take care of great power rivalry in a much more realpolitik, Kissinger, Bismarck type sense. <laughs> but what I think is happening is flexible, regional, multilateral arrangements. Countries and blocs reform on issues in a very flexible way. Look at how the role of India in various configurations with, against, together, et cetera. And I think that's something we will be seeing much, much more of, and it's probably important. And the second point I would say is at the level, at the level of between on the one hand, great power rivalry, and on the other hand, to see sort of just a free trade regime, WTO enhanced, et cetera. There's something in the middle that we also need to take care of. And that's where I think NGOs, individual state actors come in. And that is the question of defending or preserving multiplicity of cultural identities. It's the question of cultural diversity. It's the question of the legitimacy of identities, of multiple identities. And that's actually where both come together. In Ukraine, we're seeing legitimate cultural identities being you know, overthrown, but you could say unfettered concentration in cultural products with very few actors could lead to exactly the same thing, not by means of weapons, but by means of winner takes all markets that drive out cultural diversity. And I think this in the middle is where Europe can play a role because it has traditionally the most concern by design because of its multiplicity of state actors and concern for this diversity and for the multiplicity of actors. Thank you. Jakob, thank you. I'm glad. Jacob, I'm, I'm glad. I always call you Jakob, but you, you prefer Jack, uh, Jacob. Um, you, you know, beautifully said, and uh, lots of food for thought. Now, I'd be interested in people's reaction to what you've just said in terms of not only some of the, what, what you're seeing ahead and what's likely to happen. And we, you know, from Friends of Europe's point of view, the most, the, the, the importance of regionalized uh, multilateralism is key um, and actually how do you empower that more within a values framework is a big question for us as we look ahead but thank you very much for that Maria um, over to you and then I know I've got I'm going to come to uh, Monica and Elena who've got Nate hands up too but firstly over to you Maria please introduce yeah. yourself and a warm welcome to you thank you so much uh, I, uh, my name is Maria Castillo I am the EU ambassador to Korea uh, but uh, let me bring the perspective also of, of a small but developed country 
that is certainly leading the digital uh, transition. Uh, and it's also very close to ASEAN and helping also ASEAN countries. And I see many of my colleagues there uh, very much on, on, on these important investments that you need to do uh, um, on digitalization. I mean, Korea has put in uh, everything that we have been talking about, especially starting with infrastructure, uh, you know, and I remember many years serving this country and, and you could have a very good infrastructure in every corner of the country and even in the very poor rural areas. So that has certainly is, 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 a, is a must, uh, is a first, uh, first step to, we need to really push uh, if we want to help ASEAN with our global gateways uh, strategy, which is certainly uh, something concrete uh, uh, to come with um, uh, in, in, in this area. Then it, it came into more e-commerce. So you have uh, a bell, very well digital developed digital infrastructure with also very well developed uh, government service. Uh, and that has helped uh, also uh, the SMEs. We haven't talked about SMEs, but, but they play a big role yeah. and they are also the ones who are always going, you know, more um, in in the, in the second phase, and, and both uh, the infrastructure and the e, e government has has helped uh, a lot. Now they are focusing on norms, as we spoke, and they are focusing on research on research because they are the big also the big producers of semiconductors here. I mean, we have uh, Umtak has mentioned China and the US. I think we also need to to bring out other players uh, like Korea, Japan, and others who are also leading in 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 in, semi, in, 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 in the digital uh, world now if we we bring it to what you said about statement and actions now uh, we have the indo-pacific strategy uh, of course at the eu level but there is very concrete action on on digital the, mm -hmm. the digital partnerships are supposed to bring uh, and, and really some concrete uh, cooperation uh, but uh, there is a difference into i feel there is a different in perceptions for example in korea and also in singapore i've had my, my singapore colleague uh, speaking about um, perhaps more focus they are thinking more on a focus on on on, on trade related matters on, on norms and not so much on cooperation while we are looking at these partnerships in a more uh, broader uh, cooperation sense uh, i hope romana you could um, uh, also uh, <laughs> uh, tell me if i am wrong but uh, we are looking into, into more uh, cooperation broader mm -hmm. cooperation as, as the basis of these partnerships which will include infrastructure transformation of business um, public service but also skills skills uh, and education is very important we need to re diverse skills uh, to new new areas where we, we need uh, in order to push this uh, digitalization and research um, we need uh, we need also a lot of emphasis on on on, on research and I see a bit uh, Korea uh, who has you know already was well, is part of of, of, of recept now uh, where you have a digital uh, component but it's very trade oriented mm -hmm. uh, the same as the digital partnerships that they have with the singapore and others um they are also very trade oriented so we need to to broaden this and mm. that's i think the perspective the european are, are trying to bring in to try to broaden it into more a uh, broader cooperation um, in, in many areas. Uh, and I hope there we can move, uh, you know, because as we are not going, not agreeing at, at a more global level yeah. of norms and standards, mm -hmm. we are getting into more compart compartment compartmentalized uh, agreements mm -hmm. uh, where slowly little norms and standards are being uh, set up. Thank Absolutely. You. Maria, that's really helpful. Very good. You know, really interesting uh, a view about the, but you know, the what's happening now, but the potential for increased fragmentation of these regionalization and the relationships. But and you make that really important point, which hasn't been made so far, is that, you know, whilst we focus on trade and connectivity, what happens about capitalizing and, and using the importance of research? And research networks and R and D as a part of that relationship, and why should it be missing? Shouldn't it be central and at the heart of some of this, so that we're able to, as as you know, we said before, um, I suppose jumpstart or even uh, accelerate, um, you know, development in certain parts, but also making sure that when we think about what happened during COVID, the ability to share data whether that was, you know, genome sequencing and, you know, basically data about what's happening uh, in terms of um, the health crisis. It shows that we need to put the kind of R&D muscle into the trade type relationships that we are developing uh, over time, rather than seeing it as a separate element, but also, as you say, uh, avoid the fragmentation. Before I move to Monica, Irene and Barbara, I believe Ed, Ed from the UK mission, is that right? You had your, you've had your hand up and I want to bring in a UK perspective. If you're still there, I can't see you though. 
Are you there? I, I am. Thank you Hello. very much. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This is a really, really exciting um, conversation. And I uh, really agree with uh, the um, interventions you've had so far. I do introduce yourself, Ed. About... I've, just, I've just said yeah, you're that, definitely. but please do tell us, you know, where That's you're from and who you, what, you work, what you work on. Yeah, hi, I'm Ed. I work at the UK Mission to the EU and cover um, a range of things, but on this topic, mainly sort of digital markets, semiconductors, emerging tech, this sort of stuff. And I think on the on the RNI side, as you just raised, absolutely agree that the prioritizing RNI has been really key to the uh, response to the pandemic. But also, I think we'll see this in the future, like other um, key things we're looking at, like semiconductor supply chains and so on. RNI is going to be a really, really important driver of innovation and of of how we move forward and sort of globally resolve some of these future challenges to the world economy and some of the the challenges and opportunities posed by uh, digitalization of the economy and also the green transition. I think on the issue of how some of these things work out as rule makers and rule takers, we definitely see that uh, the ideal situation would be for um, something like, you know, multilateral, maybe the WTO or whatever. But realistically speaking, we're looking at a world right now where a lot of this stuff is going to be driven by values. And, and it's really important for us to where we have uh, shared values in terms of prioritizing citizens and their rights and prioritizing user experiences and competitiveness in the economy to to make our position clear on that. And we've really worked with a lot of partners with the EU who we're very like-minded with on digital issues, but also more widely at the OECD, G7, Council of Europe on issues like AI and on digital trade. And I think that that's something that's really important for us to to find a sort of a community of shared values mm -hmm. and, and countries who and partners like the EU who are willing to work with us on these issues. And that's going to be really important for the next stage on some of these things, because as you say, the, the question of who makes some of these rules is going to be a really, really key one. I think that if you look at, for example, the, the work that the EU is doing on the DMA, uh, looking at digital competition, and then the UK is doing quite similar work in some areas of the Competition Markets Authority. And we're going to be looking at also the, the work the Federal Trade Commission does in the US. We're really we're really excited to see how we can sort of have values-based alignment and and get more of a, of, as, as the title said, a nexus of, of people working together to solve these issues in the same way. Because because I think as, as we're all aware on this call, the, some of these issues really have like huge society um, spanning consequences potentially. And we really want to put values at the heart of, and like particularly liberal democratic values at the heart of our, the solutions we find collectively to them. Okay, Ed, thank you very much for that perspective, UK. And, you know, uh, as you can, obviously, with the with the onset of Brexit, people thought, oh, my goodness, what we, what are you going to do? But actually, uh, we've seen that crisis after crisis has meant there's a, there has always been and will continue to be an alignment in terms of some of the issues the UK is working on the EU and the world, the liberal world, as you call it. Um, so, um, you know, power to your elbow in that respect. And we look forward to more of that engagement. Uh, as we move forward. I'm going to um, invite Monica, who's been very patient and also someone I'm, I'm keen to bring in. Monica, hello. Hello, good morning. It's, yes, of course. Uh, what time is it over there? You're, where, you're in Georgetown University, aren't you, at the moment? I am, and it is 6.13 Eastern Standard Time, so quite early in the morning for me. But well, thank okay. you for joining <laughs> us as a result. <laughs> Please introduce yourself for the benefit of our, for our, for our virtual roundtable. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Monica Sanders. I'm a professor at Georgetown University, and I'm also the founder of a nonprofit called the Undivide Project, which actually asks the question of how can we connect communities and what can we learn from hyper local experiences being connected for the first time to inform our ideas about economic mobility and climate adaptation via IoT solutions. So I'm excited to be here and be part of this conversation because it's extremely relevant to some of the work and on the topic of research that I'm actually mm -hmm. participating in right now. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to go back to one of the points that Romana made mm -hmm. at the very beginning of this debate is investment in security, but not leaving out the human security factor mm -hmm. of it. Because we're seeing in this conversation about the digital divide and people being on the wrong side of the inequitable part of it. We are in a place where 
Yes, the United States accounts for a large part of the economic drivers of the internet, but we still have about a quarter of our population that is un or under connected and therefore can't participate in all of the benefits that come with being part of the internet. When we look at places in Asia, we have about 350 million people, according to the UNDP, who are not connected, who are also in the most climate fragile areas mm -hmm. of that very vast region that we're talking about. And I think that we could go to Europe and find similar numbers and similar issues. And so the question is, how do we reduce fragility from a human perspective and build that kind of resilience into what we're broadly calling the internet, whether we're talking about infrastructure or platforms. And I think questioning not only as multilateral engage or engagement professionals we are here, how we connect and what are the rules of the game in the larger sense, how can we participate in technology transfer and constructs of a commons called the internet in such a way that we include and bring up these un and underconnected segments of our society at large and not just think of it from a regional perspective but understanding that the economy is global and increasingly so because of digital technologies what can we do to share our ideas, our research, our R&D, and the norms that we've all constructed in the most connected parts of the global economy with those who are not. So it's similar to when we talk about helping with adaptation in un versus more resource communities, um, bringing that into the digital space. And how do we construct a commons that's inclusive for the betterment of all of us, both on a regional and a global perspective. So I really appreciate this concept of bringing human security and infrastructure security together, because I think that's an important part of working towards a solution as you were driving us to do mm -hmm. at various points during this conversation. Like where does the solution begin? Mm -hmm. Is understanding that certain dependencies are normal and normative in this conversation, and we need to embrace those as we start working towards policy frameworks. But so Monica, if I can press upon you just for one more moment, in terms of multilateralism, you know, we've, we, the US has always been a major player and a big power in our multilateral frameworks, especially post World War II. Um, what's your sense of where, you know, where, where should we be looking for who are the rule makers as we move, as we look ahead? Do we need to create something new or would you embed it within the current? institutional frameworks we have? Very, very briefly, I know it's a difficult question. I think we have to invent something new because mm -hmm. what we're seeing is there's a debate between the IGF and the ITU about how to govern the internet. And to be perfectly honest, you've got a group of actors via platforms in the United States, but also a growing, I'll call them anti-platform community who are forming DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations that are constructing different kinds of rules and they're falling outside of those multilateral norms and at a very rapid pace. So I think this is pushing us to rethink how we create multilateral frameworks and that it's not going to work to use old systems to confront new problems. So we have to invent some sort of cyber diplomacy for lack of a better way of describing it. Great, thank you. And um, have a really hearty breakfast, Monica. Make sure you do, because it's too early. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, co uh, colleagues, I have less than 15 minutes, so I'm going to, you know, ride through the glide path down to the conclusion of this conversation. So I've got a, quite a few of you lined up, but those of you who want to have a, you know, um, a, a quick peek uh, at having saying something, please do raise your hands now. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll be concluding very, very shortly in the next 15 minutes. Irene, uh, over to you, been very patient. Barbara, I'll bring you after that. And uh, Marilia also, don't worry, I have you in lineup. Uh, and, and Romana also. But over to you, Irene, introduce yourself and a warm welcome to you. Hi, I'm Irene. I am a professor at the University of Warwick. Uh, I'm also a Turing Fellow, a member of Wilson College in Cambridge. Mm. I'm also the CEO of Data Swift, a company that was formed from as you mentioned about, I think now more than 10 million pounds of UK R&D funding to build the new infrastructure for, uh, infrastructure for decentralized self-sovereign data ownership by giving every human person in the planet um, a personal data server for less than $2 a year uh, so that they can own and be a courier for their data across borders. 
Now, the, re the reason I, I thought I'll speak up was really to make the case based on the values framework mm. uh, for that self-sovereign uh, decentralized identity that is portable across borders because 90, I don't know whether everybody knows the, the, the numbers, but it's actually quite interesting. 95% of our organizations globally now are micro SMEs. Um, and the reason for that is COVID. Many people have become gigs and become shop owners They've uh, decided to lie flat and resign. And we're now <laughs> seeing that the economic life of a person is an economic life of a business. Be being a business as an economist um, is, is, from an economics perspective, is how a person really can take capital and technology. You can't take capital and technology with wage. I wrote the paper on Mimicking Firm some time ago, and it's now really showing across the world that individuals are really becoming micro-businesses. I really want to push the need to have a proper conversation on identity because it's not just personal identity now, it's business identity, it's micro business identity mm. that transcends state identity. We need to make states a subset of that sovereign identity. And it's a cooperation uh, as part of multilateral framework that is absolutely necessary because this is what the internet in the future will have to depend on. Irene, thank you so much. And I think we're going to take you up on that. And those of you who have raised something, because this conversation, you know, you know, you put it on for 90 minutes and you realise in the last 30 minutes, my goodness, you can go on for much longer. And I do apologise that I will have to cut it off very shortly. But that point you make about micro businesses, I think it's a really profound one because, you know, we've lived in a, in a century where uh, small to medium enterprises are seen as the bulwark of our economies. I think that's being smashed apart by what you're just saying. And perhaps we need to have a conversation about that. And we think it through quite carefully as we move ahead. Uh, but thank you very much, Irene. Uh, Barbara, a warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, obviously, do introduce yourself, but uh, good to have you back uh, back again. You're on mute, Barbara. There you go. You should be able to. Oh, no. No, we can't hear you. Okay, what I'm going to do, Barbara, because I really want to, you know, t take in your perspective. I, it, no, I can't hear you now. Can you hear me now? Ah, now we can. Excellent. Okay. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so I'm Barbara Plinkert. I'm the head of division for Southeast Asia and ASEAN at the European External Action Service. So um, uh, I, I just like to focus on uh, a little bit on, on on this region, Southeast Asia and uh, and ASEAN. Um, we have plenty of of ambassadors from the region present here here today, and I'm not going to repeat uh, the pertinent comments of uh, uh, that they have made already in the course of this uh, very important conversation. And also, I would like to follow up a little bit on um, some of the remarks that were made by my uh, colleagues, uh, Romana and also Maria. Um, uh, so uh, I think, I mean, a, a lot of trade is happening online now. We realize that. So, so the level of digitalization of a country will determine uh, to a large extent uh, to which, uh, to which um, it can participate in e-commerce and benefit from digital uh, transition. So there we speak a lot about this digital gap and digital divide that, that is increasing and that it, you know, we all need to work together to, uh, to, to, uh, to make smaller. And so, so the EU really supports the digital transition in ASEAN uh, through a, a number of means. Uh, this also brings me to the, to the question of who makes the rules that you have uh, asked so many times in, in, in the course of this con uh, conversation. So um, we do it jointly, obviously. It's more difficult at global level, but I think we can do a lot uh, between regions. And I think the EU ASEAN example is a really good one. Um, so, you know, we, as, as we have said and heard before, um, the EU has developed a strategy for connecting Europe and Asia already in 2019. So this goes way before the global gateway came, came into be, being. So, and this realized the huge potential of connectivity between our two regions, the EU and uh, ASEAN uh, and, and, and Asia. So digital connectivity is one of the four priorities of this strategy. And in terms of uh, increasing access to digital services while maintaining um, a, a high level of protection of consumer and personal data. 
And more concretely, in uh, December 2020, so also way before the Global Gateway, and so we have a long history specifically with ASEAN, um, uh, the EU and ASEAN issued a joint ministerial statement on, on, on connectivity, which looked at the synergies between our in EU connectivity strategy and also the master plan on ASEAN connectivity of tw uh, for, uh, 2025, which was uh, earlier mentioned by uh, Philippines Ambassador de, de Vega. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, under this strategic partnership, we have uh, many examples of how we cooperate between the EU and, uh, and ASEAN on digital issues. For example, we have an EU-ASEAN digital dialogue. We uh, uh, only recently launched a, 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 a rather large program on EU-ASEAN smart green cities. Um, and we have also, uh, we are also, for example, supporting ASEAN in the development of, a, of an ASEAN digital economy index. So, uh, I mean, the, these are all examples of where we cooperate, where we uh, try sure. to uh, align our rules uh, between ourselves and, and really to, 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 to uh, establish a, a stronger connectivity between our regions, specifically on, uh, in the digital area. And very briefly, just a couple of words on, on, um, on the Indo-Pacific strategy um, and a ministerial forum that was held in Paris on the 22nd of February mm -hmm. um, between, uh, between the EU and uh, the Indo-Pacific to discuss exactly that, you know, how do we connect better um, in the context of, of the EU's uh, newly formulated uh, Indo-Pacific strategy uh -huh. and also there uh, digital connectivity was a major uh, focus and I could go on uh, with, with several examples of what was discussed and what were the outcomes of that, but I think it would go beyond. Sure, uh, uh, but Barbara, today. Barbara, this has been really helpful because what you're demonstrating is the kind of the uh, the, the importance and the role of diplomatic effort and diplomatic connections. And as, as everyone says, you know, what the, the received wisdom, and it's, uh, it's held true, is that making sure you keep those corridors of communication open, make sure that the, dip, you know, the diplomacy works to a common and shared goal. But what I think what's what we've learned in the past 36 months and what we're learning right now is that do any of those agreements and what we're doing at the moment um, help us absorb shock and uncertainty? And I think there's something about making sure we think about genuinely what we mean by creating value-based relationships and norms and how do we hold true to them and how do we make sure that we have the levers when we have times of crisis to actually use them uh, that, that, and they work. And you know that's that's a you know that's a huge question I know, uh, and our experience shows that diplomacy is always one the day to a certain extent. But actually, in the new situations we're finding ourselves, whether it's a climate shock, health shock, security shock, um, we need to be thinking about how do we make some of these arrangements not just good conversations and dialogues and statements, but shockproof and are being are able to be activated at times of crisis. So I mean, uh, we can't solve all that in the next three or four minutes. I'm afraid, but I'm going to bring in uh, Maria, uh, Marilia uh, for, uh, from Diplo. Is that right, Marilia? That's correct. And thank you. And thank you very much for organizing this very interesting discussion. Um, I am head of digital commerce and internet policy at uh, Diplo. We are an organization based in Geneva dedicated to capacity building that falls in the intersection between digital policy and diplomacy, ranging from topics that go from cybersecurity diplomacy to AI and e-commerce in the last five years together with ITC and CATS, we have trained more than 170 trade negotiators that are really working on the joint statement initiative on e-commerce on the national level, mm. um, on trade issues from developing countries and LDCs. And the reason I'm saying this is because um, I'm, the points that I'm bringing in, mm. I come from uh, this experience of exchanging with them. I think that Singapore uh, made a very important point about economic um, integration, but integration is really happening in a fragmented way, not only fragmented between uh, big players such as uh, US and China and the rest of the world, but also fragmented in terms of uh, norm making. Um, we are seeing that norm making is really concentrated in a few countries in the Asia Pacific region, Australia, Singapore, um, Japan, and the center of gravity of norm making has really moved from the US and Europe to the Asia Pacific. Mm. You asked about rule makers in international trade. Mm. Uh, rules are being made inside trade agreements, and these are the main rule makers. 
which is very fair. However, there's a large number of countries that remain disconnected, not only in an ICT way, but also on the level of policy from regional trade agreements. And I think that capacity building is really important, not capacity building to teach these countries how to comply with existing norms, yeah. but capacity building that enables them to find the best policy options for them because somehow we need to draw a middle ground between digital free flows uh, with trust and the need for digital industrialization that I think that these countries raise uh, very correctly. And just very quick point on uh, trade diplomacy. Mm. We see that a larger number of digital policy issues are migrating to trade settings, to trade negotiations, from network neutrality to data flows to cybersecurity. And it's really important to create the ways to make trade negotiations more inclusive because digital policy has been discussed in a multi-stakeholder way. But trade negotiators, they happen, trade negotiations, they happen usually behind closed doors. And there's a way that we need to find to bring in other actors yeah. that are really important to norm making, such as the technical community, the mm. civil society and, and companies. And we need also to find a way to break silos between different parts of the government. Because if you go to the WTO, for instance, the person that represents countries in the WTO is not the same person that goes to the, the ITU or the IGF. And that really Indeed. creates a breaking in discussion. Indeed. If you analyze topics such as network neutrality, for instance, we have a large amount of information and knowledge in digital trade, digital discussions, but that has has not percolated into trade discussions in the WTO. So we need to find a hold of the government approach to discuss these issues. But that's, I know that we are short. No, we are, Marilia, but you make a really important point and we forget that, you know, when, when large institutions, um, you know, are, are full of silos. But, you know, the solution is quite simple, isn't it, what you're, desc what you're describing, because you could just need to knock heads together when you think about that, what sits in terms of uh, knowledge and data, and then you're creating tech trade agreements, for goodness sake, that should be brought together. And that's a question of leadership. But, you know, uh, surely we've learned enough that we, 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 we mustn't um, enable or rather uh, reinforce the silo mentalities that create some of the problems that we have in our societies, especially in terms of public governance. I'm, I need to wrap up, but I'm going to bring in two, uh, two people before I do. And I want to thank you all. But, and I'm sorry that I've not been able to get to all of you. And Violetta, I just want to acknowledge some of the points you're making are brilliant. And um, but I just don't have time. Uh, it's lovely to see you, you know, ex-commissioner, uh, and has very much, you know, uh, uh, generated lots of discussion during her tenure. And thank you and welcome back but i'm going to end with i'm going to go to mariam who's been very very patient and then finally finally to romana so mariam warm welcome to you introduce yourself for the the benefit of the rest of this virtual town round table hi everyone uh, so i'm a co-founder of value Cometrix. Uh, it's a fintech we aim to bring more transparency between investors and companies on esg scores and actually, uh, I would like to um, point a little bit the role of the private sector in the in this digital transition and green transition, uh, mostly investors, because today in uh, the European Union, investors are um, they, they are obliged actually to look at their portfolios in terms of uh, uh, environment, society, governance, and in terms of impact. And so while their greatest impact would be actually in emerging and developing countries, the fact that there is a scarcity of data and difficulties to measure might actually restrict the investment in these regions. So um, there is a need for a change in, in policy, and there is also uh, a need for um, more support at the same time while investing. So these are like the, the, the points that um, I wanted to point out that there might be a risk of uh, bringing even more um, difficulties between uh, uh, places where there is uh, big data and others where, where there isn't, also in terms of investments. And this gap should be definitely closed, both working on policy and on uh, processes within the, the, within the investors uh, areas. Mariam, thank you for bringing that perspective in. I'm glad I brought you in to bring that very specific private sector uh, vantage point into this conversation. So uh, thank you for that. I'm going to end now by um, inviting our Kickstarter, if you like, someone who kind of created a little bit of the framework for this conversation. Romana, back to you. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot. And I will 
I will try to uh, wrap up with what I believe is the mother of all questions and, and the main issue uh, of discussion for, for this generation of policymakers. Uh, it was mentioned many times. Uh, what are the rules? Who are the rule makers? And who are the rule keepers? Um, of course, the agenda uh, will be determined by those whose ideas are acceptable to the global majority. And I firmly believe there are two basics where we are all the same. We all want to live safe life and we all want to live life in dignity. And I think these are the two elements on which this discussion needs to be built. In the discussion, we absolutely have to bring in the non-state actors. I just checked on the Twitter uh, Elon Musk is the 20th largest country on earth. He has 78 million followers. So he, his population, if you wish, or his audience is the 20th largest uh, country on earth. The world has really changed and we have to factor in all these elements. Uh, I believe what you have uh, uh, had today should be a beginning of at least a year-long conversation sure. because uh, there is so much to be uh, uh, brainstormed on uh, that um, you know time is of essence and and we should start finding concrete answers to these questions uh, as soon as we can Romana, thank you very much. And, you know, I love the fact, you know, that there is a, there's a simplicity in human nature, isn't there? In the sense that you kind of, you really configured it down that we all want to live, uh, it, you know, in a safe, uh, uh, in a safe manner. We want to feel protected and we want safety at the heart of what we do, but also want dignity. Uh, and we want, our, I suppose the other thing is to have, to leave, le lead purposeful lives and have the opportunity to actually make something of ourselves. And so, you know, these are simple truths and should be the starting point in the basis of some of our, you know, bigger policy conversations. Um, so, Romana and all of you, thank you. Um, time is up on me. It's now, I'm six minutes over. Um, I just want to thank all of you. This has been such a rich conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed engaging with you. And I hope that you've all found this to be, um, uh, uh, I suppose, the kind of conversation we need to have more of not just once a year or twice a year. It feels like there's a sense that we need to, as you say, Romana, have a series of conversations of some of the key points that have come out of this, um, this discussion today. And it is part of a series uh, of trade and diplomacy network ne nexus that we've initiated. But I think there's scope for rescoping some of our thinking as a think tank around some of the issues and uh, points you've raised. And we look forward to working with you in particular in developing these further. Thank you all very much. Um, keep safe, mind your distance, and keep an eye on our website. And we'll be in touch with you again for the, our next series of events and discussions. Thank you all so very much and take care. Bye-bye.